and we are we are back we are part of the back end team in the 10x we're building the 10x system so today we are going to have a discussion a little discussion about what um back end is what front end is what differentiates the two and then we can we have a, a little chat about apis then we would have a demo on how to build um a back end and then uh, i mean an api so um let's let's get into it i think we would we would also have time for questions so when you if you have questions you can put you can put the questions in the chat or you can judge them down and then when the time for questions come in we can have we can have a discussion on i mean we can answer those questions okay so let's let's jump right in then okay so front end back end and apis what are we talking about today so today as i said earlier the discussion is going to be on what is back end what is front end what are apis and what are some of the types of apis then we will jump into demo into a demo on how to build an api mallet will take you through that then we would have some questions uh, i i promise this is going to be an interesting a discussion all right so let's start what is back end so back end itself back end what is back end back end itself as as its name suggests it means it's at the back so we we would say this is actually the part where the users don't see so whenever we say front end back end we are having we are saying this with re um, reference to the users so what the user sees is what's in front of the user what the user does not see it is what is behind so we would say that is a back end and that's the front end so basically the the name given to these parts of software defines itself but theoretically let's say the definition of a backend as we have it the backend refers to the parts of a computer application or a program's code that allow uh, that allow it to operate and that cannot be accessed by the user so while this is technically true it does not always it, it's not always true particularly when it's um let's say a web app the users can access the data in the back end the data is part of the back end system so the users can access it but there are some types of software where the user does not access the um, i mean the data in the back end in any way so when we get to that end we would uh, i would explain that with the types of api so to to have a um a clearer picture what exactly is the back end simply the back end is a layer so we would say um those of us who like uh, a pizza or um wafers we would say let's say um back end is is one of the layers and usually the one beneath so the toppings we might say the toppings are the front end and then the um let's say the bread like structure beneath would be um what the back end is so simply the back end is a layer that is directly or indirectly that is below the front end the reason why i'm saying directly or indirectly is there sometimes there is and that is mostly the case there is an api which stands between the back end and the front end there are some systems where the um the front back end and the front end they you don't have anything in between them but usually you have the api between the front end and the back end so as we go ahead this becomes clear so what if if you are working in the back end what are some of the tasks that you would be looking at in the back end so you would be looking at automated testing you will be working on you you are with a startup maybe the startup as as, as as the name suggests it's a startup and you don't have a lot of you don't have a lot of people a lot of traffic heading towards your application or whatever you are giving out there 
Now, a back-end engineer or a back-end developer would have to look at how they can use tools to make it scalable in, 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 in times where the startup expands. So you would have scalability. And then I, the greatest, the greatest, and I, I think this underlines the work of a back-end developer or a back-end engineer is handling and management of data. So when we say handling, with machine learning, we come to understand that there are some data pre-processing, data cleaning processes and all that. And when you are in the back end, you should be able to know how to handle data and at least sometimes how to clean data um, comes in handy, even if you are not working in a machine learning ecosystem. And then also the security of the system is very important. If you are in the back end, you are, you are taxed with holding, making sure that the data that the system runs on, I mean, is, is uncompromised. And as part of that duty, you would also have to ensure that nobody who, you, no one can access the data without authorization. So these are some of the tasks that goes on in the back end. The ads, the demo comes up, you would, you would realize, and then you would have, um, first-hand feel of some of these things I'm talking about. With this, let's move ahead um, to the front end. So what is the front end? And the front end also, as I said earlier, is what we see. So it, another term given to it is the client side. So the client here, and let's say the client is sort of a synonym for a user. So the client side. So front end, also known as client side is part of a web application or a software that a user sees and interacts with directly. So you can have the best of systems running behind, uh, the best of systems running uh, in the back end. If your front end sucks, people won't, I mean, your, your whole application or your whole system wouldn't make any sense to the user. So let's say, it, this is an example is working in the terminal as opposed to working in, in, a, uh, in a GUI. So if you are typing in the terminal and then you are also dragging and dropping, you notice that the dragging and dropping is more visually appealing than working in the terminal, but it's virtually the same thing. And that's how it looks like when you don't have a front end, which, which actually, let's say, um, gives the picture or gives the beauty to the system you have. And then what is the front end again? Simply the front end is also a layer. What differentiates the front end from the back end is the position of the layer. The back end is at the back, the front is in, the front is just what the user faces directly. So what are some of the tags in the front end? So we have um, SEO, um, which is uh, quite, quite also, let's say a topic on its own. So search engine optimization, usability and accessibility testing. So in the front end, you would want to ensure that people who would come there, you, your, your site can be accessed by people. If the, if, um, it should be, it should be able to be accessed by people, even people who are um, blind. So it should be accessible by screen readers and uh, I mean, those who cannot hear, I mean, you sort of find a way to also um, pass on information to them. So that is the accessibility aspect. And then you would also have to ensure that the colors that you are using in the front end to display does not clash. So you would have um, the background, the background should also bring out the, the text in there. I hope um, in the morning when you had a discussion on front end, some of these things were mentioned. Now, graphic design and image editing. And as I said, once you are making things visually appealing to users, you can't do away with um, the aspects of design. So you look at graphic design, you do image editing there, and then web performance and browser compatibility. So you see this, the front end is all about rendering. So display, some browsers display things in a different way. So Maybe you intended it to be placed in the left-hand corner. When it came on 
let's say explorer explorer couldn't display it in the left hand corner it, it had shifted a little bit to the right and as a front end developer you have to ensure that you would have the the required and the, the required and the necessary settings for each and every browser or, or if not each and every browser the very common one so that you would have a uniform view a uniform display on all ends so with with all of these sets we say the back end actually the back end drives the system and then the front end displays i mean interacts with the users now let's look at apis so apis would say i mean is a short form the uh, application the, the longer version of it is the application programming interface so in this situation this is sort of a way where two systems two systems can now communicate without um the user being heavily involved so the user will just pass his request to the api and then the api would also pass that request to the back end and then retrieve that information takes that same information and give it to the front end so you notice why this is why i said that not you do it's not always that the back end is just a layer behind the front end sometimes there is this api which stays in between and then it, it carries it carries what the user wants to do in the front end takes that information to the back end retrieves what the user wants and then bring it back to the front end so that the user can see what um, the user can see the request, the response to the request that was sent. So we'd say an API is a set of programming code that enables data transmission between one software product and another. And simply put, that is it. I mean, it can, it can have other definitions which might make it a bit complicated, but let's keep it this way. And we, we can have simply two types of um, apis we can have apis we can find different apis by how they are used so we say the use case and then we can categorize apis by how they are accessed so that is also um, availability so let's look at um, the use case for now so we can have database apis right and this enables communication between an application and database just as the name sounds the data that is used to power the application will reside in a database and on top of that database usually there would be an api it's not usually most of the time uh, there would be an api on top of the database where request comes in and then the api takes the request sent and then look at what is being sent send it to the back end retrieve the information and bring it back to the front end and then we have web apis this provides machine readable data and functionality transfer between web-based systems so in this situation an api might exist on another system it might not necessarily be on the back end of let's say um 10 10, 10 academy system it might exist on another system and then we want to use that api to enhance the user uh, the functionality of the 10x system so we assess an api of another system and an example of it is that um, such an api can be categorized under web apis then we have operating system apis look the os that we are using we are using now it has processes in there and then these processes some processes are allowed to access certain data some processes are not allowed some users are allowed to see certain data and all that and what handles this is the api so when the request goes in the api now checks and see if the person who wants to get it is authorized if the person is authorized then the api goes and takes the data and then bring it back to the user so the operating systems whether linux whether mac which is also uh, like linux and um, windows and then what have you all have apis and then we have remote api so this defines standards of interaction for application running on different machines so 
when these remote APIs are on the web, they are web APIs. But when, let's say, in an organization, that will become clearer. In an organization, there's um, one system at one end and then another system at another end. And in that same organization, they are making use of that same API, not, part not particularly on a web platform, but probably um, interacting through the network not on the let's say through um the routers and all that so this in itself would also would be categorized under remote apis if it's on the web platform these remote apis can equally be spoken of as web apis now let's look at apis api types by availability so we have private api and as the name suggests it is private within an institution so 10x, we have created an API for our usage. And this API is not out there for people to use. Nobody can have access to, API, to the API. And because it is only available within the organization, it is a private API. So as we have here, it is designed for improving solution and services within an organization. And then we have partner API. So these partner APIs, Usually you would have, let's say, um, you, you, you sell. So you sell certain services and people have signed on. These people are now, these organizations are now categorized as partners. And because they've signed on, they now have the ability to use some APIs which you have designated for their usage per their subscription. And these types of APIs fall under partner APIs. And then the public API is just an API, which is the way anybody else can have access to. All you need is maybe if you have to install certain things, you install it and then you send requests to the API and then, then the API can get you. So Google, um, there is a Google Map API, which every developer can use the Google Map API to display some sort of maps on their mm -hmm. system. And that comes with limitations as well. So with the availability by type, we have private API, partner API, and then public APIs. Now let's have, let's say a 30 second look at this. You notice the back end, that is where the food is being cooked. The front end is where the customers are being served. The waiters and the waitress are the API. So the waiter will come to the user or the front end or the customer and ask him what do you want the customer makes a request the waiter goes to goes back and tell the people serving which in itself is an interface between the front and the back end and then the api that oh somebody wants this particular food then the api looks at the request and i mean the the back end whatever layer is between the back end and the api it takes a look at the request then gets what's the <clears throat> what the request wants when the um, waiter or waitress bring it back brings the request back it's no more a request it is now a response now on the other end we see how the front end and the back end to s you see how messy i would put quote unquote messy the back end is and look at how it has been beautified at the front end so the 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 whole situation is in the back end I would say there is organized chaos. It looks like there is chaos, but it is really an organized chaos. And then in the front end, everything looks fine. You won't even think for a minute that at the back, this is how the picture looks like. So um, from here, I would hand over to Marlet, right? To take, to take you guys through the demo on how um, to build an API and then how the backend system went. So after that, we will take your questions and then um, we will call it a day. So let's, let me hand over to Marlet then. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Then, so uh, as Michael, explain that there is a difference between this 
back and then front end. So more or less, basically, we, we use this Flask as a backend for our DNX system. And I'm just going to demonstrate a simple Flask app with a simple API request. And uh, if you have any question, we can discuss on that. Basically, let me describe first Flask. And Flask is a Python framework, a microservice framework, which helps us to interpret Python functions into uh, web browsers and into HTML requests. So having this uh, the advantage of this both executing Python function as well as interpreting uh, HTML uh, markups into uh, some sort of front end. We use this Flask and as a web framework, uh, Flask have many advantages. Uh, well, like the reason why we use this Flask as first of all, as a data engineer or as a machine learning engineer, we are expert on the Python, basically for data analysis for uh, number of um, our computing, we will use this Python because it's most efficient and stable than the others like JavaScript and also. Yeah, I will share, Musa, I will share my screen just to explain the theory part about I don't have any presentation on it. Um, so having um, this in mind, like we have a number of um, server-side language, for example, like um, Python or Node or PHP, or there are many others out there, but for uh, like the preferable language for data engineers, we will use this Python. So basically we are expert and it's expected that we are expert as on the Python language. So we need to adapt some of the web framework for Python. So there are there is Flask as a primary and also Django is there. We can use either of them. But for today's demo, I have Flask on my plate. Um, so why do we use Flask? Just to have easy and maintainable system. And as if it is a lightweight um, framework, we don't have to maintain, uh, it, it doesn't cost us to maintain and to develop the Flask app. And also we can have this REST request or um, you can send a REST request from Flask to the front end. So basically we can use these five basic HTTP meters, including the gate, post, put, um, delete, and patch. So get request for fetching data from the backend. And like just, it's not that much secure, but we can use gate uh, for fetching data and post for update and creating data. So if you have a post request from the front end, you can send data from the front end and the back end will reply through your request. And also if you have, if you want to update, put is an alternative method to update um, uh, HTTP, uh, an alternative HTTP method. And patch also similar to update, but um, they have their own destination. You can read about that. And delete is also there. So you can use uh, one of them uh, based on your use case. So if I say um, a little bit about Flask. Let me start the demo on the Flask and I have built can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, we can hear yeah, you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh,
So uh, how do we create this plus app? It's ordinary app like an other Python package, which we create on our uh, base code. So it's similar to that, but there are special function. We use this Flask library. Uh, so the requirements are having Flask and Flask related um, libraries like Flask JWT, Flask Login Manager, um, and also many supported SQL alchemy to connect it to database. We can use all of them. Um, and like, why do we use this flask if we need something which needs real time computing? For example, let's say you have a data which is directly uh, come from database and your database is something in tabular format. So you have to fetch that and you have to compute certain computing. And after you compute that, you will present it to the front end. Basically, this if it Hello guys. Um, it seems oh, Malet just went off. Hello Malet, are you back? Yes, I'm there. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So can you point out me where did I stop? Like talking. I think you 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 went off right at the point where you mentioned um I think the use of the the use no the use of um flask and um i think you were going to talk about uh okay let's have a use case about flask then yeah flask we have in flask you we have like let's create one scenario um i just want to create a backing which can provide uh, data for your uh, dashboard and your dashboard needs to be computer based on from um, let me can you see my screen? Yeah, it's, we can see it now. Yes. So on 10x we have a grading data. And we have your competency radar approach. As you can see from the uh, 10x structure, the grades are different and the competencies are also uh, need some computing to compute them. So in that case scenario, we can put this as a batch processing. Let's say you have a weak grade, then uh, your weak competency based on the week I can calculate and I can store that into a database, which is a simple use case. Then based on that, your API request will send directly to the database and the result or the response will come and display on the front end, like what we are doing now on the next class. Uh, in that scenario, we are using the SAP as a content service manager which can help us to authenticate users and which can help us to, uh, which, can, which can reduce the time to build these API endpoints and we can directly uh, use the API endpoints built by Strapi. So, uh, if our need is real time, let's say I need something which is computed on the real time month, and I, I will send the your grades, and I need um, 
the competencies on real time manner. In that case, I should have to use uh, Flask as a service provider and as a middleware between the back end and the front end. So Flask will act as a back end, also as a service um, content manager, and it will uh, return back to me the result which I want. And once it's calculated, your competency is based on the grade which I have entered. So in two different scenarios, we can have two different options. So based on your use case, you can choose either to use Flask or other service managers uh, through database. So if uh, there is any question, you can forward. So let me start by describing the polar structure of this Flask demo app. So once for this Flask demo, I have one folder which I have gathered. In. I think there is a delay in there. Yeah, we can hear you. Hey, if you can lift your voice a bit. Okay. So let me describe the 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 API which contains all the routes which I build for custom API uh, in the points and also the app.py, which is the main class which I will use in this flask. So in this uh, just specify the port number and the host as 00. You can specify your local host 127.0.1 or whatever host you want to give. So this one it will help you on uh, to give this based on args when the deployment comes. You will have a dynamic IP. So you will try to manage that in this way. And to initialize this one, uh, we will use the Flask uh, basic, the core Flask. So, so I will have this Flask as uh, an import, then uh, the blueprint class or the skeleton or the skeleton for my uh, Flask app which I can gather my resources inside it. So I can initialize that here. And the application name and some uh, sort of the application needs, for example, for this file upload, I need to specify this, this type of uh, max configuration, max content links and uh, upload paths and secrets, uh, API secret, which I want to use on the JWT uh, to generate this JWT token. So I will use that one, and I will specify this in an init method. And maybe you can, you can do this one in the folder in PY or in the main folder also. And then based on that, just to make it more modular, I have entered it into a service, a resource, and apps. Uh, so uh, on this. I have these three classes. The first one, books class, then the upload class, and the main class, upload class. And from, um, if I start from the login, I have this simple uh, API reader um, to when it gets request. It will require you an API, um, an authentication token, then it will return the books with the Authors, book name with its respective author. Uh, so to get this token, uh, uh, I should have to write some login or I should have to get some 
second. Basically, you have to specify your username based on what you need. Let's say I um, just want to authenticate the username and password, so I will do that. But if you want to authenticate your user based on another format, you will have that uh, um, an interface for that. Then it will ask user to enter whatever information you want. Then based on that, the JWT token will match your uh, database entry and your user login. Uh, based on that, the token will be generated and it will be resulted as a token. Let's say I want to generate one token for myself, I have tried it here. So here, in order to send a request to my API endpoint login, I just have to specify the, the URL first. Uh, this URL is the key where my app.py will start and the port which I specified earlier will be used as an input here. Then once you specify the IP, then slash um, colon the port number, then your uh, API endpoint name. My API endpoint name for this one is login, so I have username and password. So for this one, if I ask is for JWT token, it will generate uh, this JWT token from uh, a Flask built-in JWT. Uh, library, so this will help us to authenticate. Once it's encoded into a uh, H, H algorithm, then based on the algorithm, you will decode that one into the original username or password when you need after uh, the authentication purpose. But to send this through URL, this one, this one is more safe than the other, so you will attach every request which comes through this um, for your secured API request will pass through this one. Uh, if I show you one endpoint for our, let me see if there's, So as you have seen, this is the URL, which for our academy uh, dot Then from this onwards, from starting from the API to grades, this will specify my API route. I'm just trying to get specific data from API uh, to grades. And I just want to play data with its relationship. So based on that, I can get all the relationship which I have maybe from our, you can see that we have an ID for each and and maybe a score for the one hour test and for a name for this specific user. And we can get different things for that specific um, user and based on that specify your API endpoint like this one. And if you want to make a post request, you can change this from the post and you will send that request and the request will be routed there. As I have said earlier, the method will use to fetch and post method to edit or create. And so having this uh, I have generated the page, so in the book stuff, it will refer me a token. If I go to this, um, I have defined this to search. I don't have uh, any data implemented here, but as a data set, I have given this to user Michael and user Mahalit as. Um, like you can think of it as a database and I just try to match it. If it's matched, the, it will return back to me the 
variability token, which is um, encrypted by SHA algorithm. And that will be an input for me. And also, uh, if I get, a, um, if I send a request, for example, let's say I want to see books and their names, so I should have to specify um, the books, uh, like this one, as an API endpoint. Then if I send a request, and I have to here one thing which you don't have to forget, I have put in the JWT token which I generated earlier here in this place as an authorization key with barrier. Then based on that, it will uh, it will know me whether I am the one who sent the request or not. If I like remove this one, it will definitely give me an error because we will need we will require uh, a JWT token for this. Uh, a specific request, so the error will come out from what I have specified on the exception part for this one. So far, so any questions? So having this uh, as an input, we need to have this availability token. Uh, to access securely our flag API point to communicate through the network. And just to upload the, for example, if I want to upload one file, so I have this one, this little interface here for file uploading. And from as you see, I have used the localhost file. And uh, uh, an IP and the port number is 5000. Then, if I browse um, one of the pictures we have here, that will upload my picture. And I get this one from the upload folder. And so, I have some of the uploaded files. So in order to do this one, you have to specify where should your apples should stay. And also there are some uh, static files uh, which you need to specify, like the HTML which these things are stored because uh, all the things we write in class is fight and best. So we need some HTML content. So I have a template for them for them and the index.html with the content. So if I want to get a Python function result, I should have to, uh, I should have that one is ginger template and I'll bring out the result like this one. And so the pure HTML file will be interpreted by the browser as you Written them. If you are some CSS here, you should have to specify them into the static folder. There is also an static folder, and on the static folder, you can add your CSS file and you can point out them in the index.html. Or if you have another page, you can specify them in the rest of the pages which you have uh, as a static asset for your website. So from the API endpoint, uh, we have some service like the authenticator. The if you have service switch, um, like if computing, which needs to be done separately, you can separate it into uh, another different folders. And based on that, you will, you will call and you will import everything into your uh, resource to be routed for the future. So if you have a question, let me have it. Maybe let's make the discussion open and we can discuss.
We are waiting for your questions. Wow, this is amazing. So you, you, mm -hmm. everything went down very well. You virtually didn't have any question. Um, example of integrating the front end and the back end um, with, with React. No, currently I am no, but uh, I think if you would need that, then probably we would have to make maybe make it another day because currently we don't have uh, anything of that sort. Yeah, but if you want to integrate this um, class back into into your React, just whatever whatever thing you you can do in the Flask, you have this API URL, and we specify the API URL into your uh, React or TypeScript code, then you will fit all the results, the result will come out there. Then from there, you can drive, uh, you can put in whatever you want. So um, to add to what Malet is saying, I mean, that is the purpose of the API. So you can have the, um, you can have your backend um, system in, uh, in another language, and then you, all you do is just send requests to it. And then the API can get the um, response and then bring it back to whichever system you are running on the other end. As you can see here, you can um, have your API in front of us available there on your TypeScript file, something type script for um we will have created for and you can specify like you can use the fetch method to fetch then based on that you use then based on that you will uh insert your API URL for this one we have is djmartinacademy.org slash jobs as an API endpoint. So from that, once this use fetch calls this API endpoint, the data will come and we start processing that data into where you want to present it in table like this one, or you want to present it in 
charts or in something else. Uh, so, Malat, you meant to be sharing your screen because I think uh, I'm seeing um, Michael's screen. Uh, really? Okay. Maybe you can't. Sorry, then I think you have to pin it. So, let me just stop sharing from my end. I think I've stopped sharing so you can see Malat's screen. This is the one of the page switch we will for 10x, and we have a flask bucket which is pretty much for the months now. So, basically, what it does is having this as a URL and attaching this as an API, jobs as a slash jobs as an API endpoint, we will use this as a complete URL to use, use fetch method from Node, from React. Then uh, the JSON which is sent from the API, uh, the one, something which is like this. And, Every your, every of your requests should have to come in something like this, and this will be accessible by our uh, client in the front end. So basically, you will try to through this result, and you will present them in any way you want. So the thing is using this fetch method to fetch the data and have this. Uh, the full URL, including your data uh, for your API endpoint. For an API endpoint, there are jobs, there are endpoints, as you have seen earlier in the books. Also, uh, for this, we have, we have, we can have, like, this one for all books, but you can have, uh, if you want to show only one book, you will have that by specifying that unique identifier for that specific uh, thing. So in, instead of searching for the whole thing, you can get single or some sort of, based on some condition, you can filter out your data which comes from the API endpoint. OK, okay. so Let's see, thanks. All right, so um, as it seems like you guys don't have questions, right? So in the in the slides, I intentionally left something out. And once it seems like everything is understandable, I would want to ask that question. That I, since you don't have a lot for us, maybe we have only one for you. So with all that has been said about APIs, Malet has mentioned a lot about a lot about API endpoints. Can someone explain to us what an API endpoint is. I intentionally left that one out in the slide. All right, Musa. I'm also uh, being a trainee today, I'm learning. Um, so I think it's, uh, just like a slash jobs, right? That would be an endpoint, right? Um, I don't know technically how to explain it, uh, but it would be, <clears throat> it's linked to what data to return or what, where to send requests. So uh, yeah, something like, cause you have um, your main URL, uh, whether it's uh, pjmatch.tenacademy.org, but anything after the slash, then that would be an endpoint uh, because it returns different things uh, depending on, on, on what you query. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, can we have another person? Okay, so we started at, um, I think, five minutes late, so we'll probably end at 2.5, if that's okay with you guys. So can we have one person uh, who would also say something in addition to Musa, what Musa said? And then 
uh, a final word on the endpoints, and then we'll call it a day. All right, so let me let me put in the final word on what an endpoint is. So imagine you go, you go to an e tree, right? And then at the e tree, you have um you have let's say uh you have cubicles, cubicles which are labeled let's say um, rice. This is um chips. We have chicken and we have um maybe pork or something else. Then you tell a waiter that I want rice. So the end point in this situation would be the waiter would now go to the cubicle labeled rice to go and get the rice for you. Because as I said, at the back end, it's an organized chaos. There are a lot of things happening, which looks like chaos from outside. But when you draw closer, you, you notice there is an organization there. So you might see a lot of waiters moving up and down, up and down. But then before you get there, as you draw closer, to where you are going to get the food, you notice that there's jollof, there's um, rice, there's uh, chicken, there's this. So you go to the exact point where, which is labeled what you need. And that is the end point. Okay. All right. Amal says. I think we have one or two minutes. Let me go through this. Okay. Malet, go ahead. And then um, Amala, answer your question in the chat section. Uh, so basically, let me show you this uh, pointing from the community, and it's one of the content uh, manager uh, systems we have in the and it's an open source. You can clone it. Run you. It makes you up very easy because it will allows you to create number of like content, including tables with their relationship. You don't have to worry about that. And also it will handle, handle the user authentication for you. Let's say these are the, this is one of the examples which we have as, any, as a table for us. And it has no relationship. And we can easily manage this relationship. We don't have to worry about how we can handle the database. And how we can try this um, like joining multiple queries because this will allow us to use GraphQL as an advantage with its uh, Strapi. So, Strapi have a plugin for REST as well as for GraphQL. So, you can use either of them to insert, update, delete, or to perform these uh, measures. And uh, this will reduce the time you spend to uh, like write. This API endpoint includes one uh, thing. So basically, the user authentication will be done based on things which you specify, but you can use the advanced user authentication by using this login with Google, or you can use the only by logging with Strapi, and also you can have a secure uh, API um, communication by having these API tokens. And also, you can also upload files there. And there are multiple roles, so you can specify everything as you want. Uh, let me, let's say, as a developer, I, I just want to grant, um, maybe your use case may have number of roles like author, editor, and super admin. So maybe some of them should have to be only author, some of them should have to be only editor. So you can easily manage that role uh, using this strapi and also you can uh, have this user role as well. And um, you can also have the email plugin and to share it from uh, from the personal email and we are using this to reset your so one of the advantage which Strapi give us is easily managing this, uh, this password setting stuff using emails. And also you have uh, different roles as well 
uh, not for this app administrator, but for your application user. Like the previous role is for the backend administrators and for the roles which are for the front end, let's say as a trainee, your friend as a staff, uh, the role is different and as a public viewer, the role are different. So we have we should have to separate these things and SAPI will help us to do this differentiation. So what I can say at the end of this that is strap introduction if you have a stable or if you want to connect directly from database to strapi um, and to your front end you can definitely use strapi and it will reduce number of works for you but if you need real time you can use you can add a python uh, or a trust back, uh, back end as well api endpoint in addition to the one who is uh, provided by the strapi one This is what I have, and if you have any questions, let me have, or else we can. So I think our time is gone. Um, we started at one, I mean, one five UTC, and it's two six now. So it seems you don't have any questions, but in case you have any any other questions, I am on Slack as well, so you can add me. And then, um, if there are any specific questions, we can give answers to them on on Slack as well. So, uh, about them, say you much. Maybe I would say goodbye for now. Maybe we might meet some other time. If Margaret has some final words, then Margaret closes us. So goodbye, and we'll meet Thank some other time. Time, and if you have any question, you can write us on the Slack, and we will discuss on there or else we can have this kind of discussion in the next days also. Thank you. All right, bye-bye.